OK. So our first topic of discussion will actually be an ODE for two reasons. Number one, sometimes PDEs in very special situations can be reduced to ODEs, very, very special situations. And of course, we'll concentrate on those. Because in situations when you can actually solve the PDE, you can find a lot of insight. But also, because I want to talk about a much bigger point. Maybe this will be the most important 30 minutes in your mathematical lives. At least that's my hope. Because two questions. ODE. Everybody recognizes this as an ODE. U is an unknown function of time. It's second derivative minus second times its first derivative plus a times the function itself equals 3 times e to the minus 5t. Who can write out the solution of this equation? That's pretty good. OK, because you've taken an ODE class. But even if you couldn't, and I could easily make it such that even the hands that were up would go back down. Should I make it such? I'll make it such temporarily. How about this? OK, whose hand was up before? It's not up anymore, right? Shut up and put it down. Put it down. You don't, <laughs> you don't know. OK. <laughs> That's not the point. The point that I want to make is that all of you, even if you don't know what the solution to this equation is, you should all be able, as mathematicians, to write down what the equation looks like, its structure, which is much more important than identifying the actual solution itself, knowing exactly what it looks like, its structure. So that's what we'll get to in just a moment. And that's one of the most important skills as a more mature mathematician, is to be able to look at this problem and to say that it's exactly the same as this problem. Who sees these two problems as exactly the same? Still a couple of good hands? That's good. OK, but I'm happy to see that most of the people don't have their hands up. They're exactly the same. Let me explain why they're exactly the same. So we'll talk about this problem for a little bit. And then I will slowly go from linear system of equations to terminology that will describe this system. But you will also begin to see that it's describing this system as well. And because you know what the solution to this system looks like, you will also know what the solution to this system looks like. What do we have here? A linear system of equations. We write it in this way. We usually like calling it AX equals B, because we think of this matrix as A. X is the vector of unknowns. And whatever is given on the right-hand side is B. So this is AX equals B. But the two interpretations that you've spent most of your time with in high school and then in lemma have nothing to do with the matrix language of this expression. What are the two common interpretations? The first interpretation is the row interpretation. When you think of this as a combination <coughs> excuse me, of three equations, the first one being x plus 4y plus 7z plus 14t equals 41, two more equations from these other coefficients. And then you do with it whatever you want to do with it. But that's how you look at this and see it. it. Has nothing to do with matrix multiplication. Just a convenient way of writing things. Now a much better approach for most applications in linear algebra is to think of this as a decomposition problem, where you're decomposing this vector as a linear combination of these four. And x, y, z, and t are the names for the unknown coefficients. And it's very nice because there is a better geometric analogy. All of these concepts of linear dependence and independence and null space all become very important and all allow you to find the answer, even though what you would actually do is probably the same Gaussian elimination. 
or in this case, you would probably guess the solution because it's what you just saw on your quiz. Okay, just to make sure it's running, right? It says rec at the top. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the third interpretation is maybe in some ways even more dominant because it carries over to other situations. And that interpretation really says we have a matrix A. Maybe it's three by four in this case. Well, in this case, it's three by four, but any size. We have our vector of unknowns, x. And we have a right-hand side that is known, b. And so we have ax equals b. It's almost like 5x equals 3. And the solution is 3 fifths. It's almost like that, except it's not. But you can kind of think of it this way. It doesn't really suggest to you how to solve it. That's the problem. Because when you're solving, I'll write it down so I can point to it. 5x equals 3, at least you know what to do. You'll divide both sides by 5. Or you'll multiply both sides by 1 fifth, a more appropriate way of saying it. Here, this way of writing doesn't give you a clue on how you solve it. And ultimately, if you give this problem to MATLAB, it will do Gaussian elimination. If A was square and invertible, then by all means, you would write x equals a inverse B. But that's a very, very rare situation. A common situation is like this. The matrix A is either not square, and then you cannot even talk about its being invertible. And if it's square, its columns could be linearly dependent. It's singular. And then you can once again not talk about it being invertible. Yet you want to find its general solution. From that point of view, this is not helpful. OK? But is this still helpful? If you can't do this, if you can't do this kind of logic, then what help is algebra if you can't use algebraic ideas? You could say that the whole point of using algebra, algebraic notation, is that you let fly your algebraic ideas. And the only algebraic idea here is to divide both sides by A because we have to isolate X. But we cannot. Okay. Well, it turns out that even without division, uh, this algebraic way of writing things is still very helpful. And I will give you a very nice application. And I will start putting it in the language slowly, if it works. That kind of applies to this. And you'll be able to start seeing this in the same way. Well, we know, and what I'll do now is prove what we know, is that the solution, the general solution, which means all possible solutions captured all possible solutions captured in a single expression. We know that the general solution looks like this, that it's a particular solution. And what does particular solution mean? Any one solution that satisfies this equation. For example, 1, 10, 0, 0. Everybody agrees? Any one. You might worry, well, what if I choose the wrong one? You can't. Any single one, any one particular solution. The article is very important. can do it in Russian. A particular solution. It's a particular solution. And more importantly, it's any one. Not any one is better than any other. Any particular solution. And what saves it is that you say plus the null space. And if you've captured the null space correctly, then this captures all possible solutions. No more, no less. All possible solutions which means that any solution to this system can be represented as your particular solution of choice plus some vector from the null space. And, and if you take a particular solution of your choice and take any vector from the null space and you find the sum, what you will have is a solution to this problem. So I just broke it up into two statements. The statement that this captures all possible solutions to the system, no more, no less. In a way, there are as many solutions to the system as there are elements in the null space. You take any element in the null space, any, shift it, shift it, add to it, by the, your choice of a particular solution, and you have a solution to the system. Works both ways. No, very much not part of the null space. So null space 
is a function of the matrix only and how its columns are related to each other. That's the essence of the null space. Captures the relationships among the columns. That's what the null space is all about. You can determine the null space, and that will be important over there. You can determine the null space without even knowing what the right-hand side is. It has nothing to do with the right-hand side. It only has to do with the matrix itself and the relationship, relationships among its columns. And the particular solution has everything to, to do with how the right-hand side relates to the columns of the matrix. And you have to find only one such relationship. So let me now prove it, that this is what captures all possible solutions. And that's why I call it the general solution. That it's this expression that captures all possible solutions. I could try and prove it from the row-wise perspective, I don't even know how to do that. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know how to do it. We can do it from the point of view of linear decomposition. We certainly did that in lemma. You can certainly find that on lemma. Not really a proof, because I don't like proofs, but the arguments that lead to this conclusion, definitely there, and I think it's very, very intuitive and very important to understand that perspective. But it's this, the algebraic language, that gives the most direct proof and the easiest proof, and a proof that you should certainly have mastered. Okay, let's prepare for that proof, because the proof itself is one and a half words. You almost get lost and there is nothing there, and yet it's the proof. So it's all the words and the framework around it. Right? So now you have to think of this being written next to this, actually, as matrix multiplication. And whatever interpretation you look at it, you will see that it corresponds to matrix multiplication. That's very important. Because when you look at it as a decomposition problem, you're thinking this column equals this column times x, this column times y, this column times z, this column times t. Do you see that it's matrix multiplication? It's the linear combination of the columns of this matrix where the coefficients are taken from the first column of this matrix equals this column. So it's strict matrix multiplication. And what would happen, now let's, let's start expressing words like a particular solution as mathematical relationships. For example, what will happen when I multiply A by my particular solution? Let's think about this. If I took X particular, we're thinking a good one is what? 1, 10, 0, 0? Anybody prefers a different one? I, I wish you would, because they're all equal. But let's take this one. What would happen, what would I get if I multiply this matrix by this particular solution? So you, everybody has to do it. In retrospect, you'll be like, of course. But you have to do it. Why don't you mentally do it and multiply this by this vector, A, by your choice of particular solution. Well, it's one of this column plus 10 of this, none of third and fourth. Hey, it's B. Well, of course it's B. That's what it means to be a solution of any kind, whether it's particular or whatever. That if you plug it in, you get the right-hand side. That's what it means to be a solution. It's one of those things that are so simple you don't realize you don't realize it. <laughs> okay, so you will get B. Definitely get B. So let's put this in the vault. We have this now. A of XB equals B. That's the, this is basically a matrix expression for the fact that XB is the solution. When you plug it in, you get B. That's what it means. Now let's take any vector from the null space. Let's not take the whole null space because that's a lot. <laughs> let's just take one vector. We'll call it little n. We'll just test it with little n. So what happens? What's a good one? Well, you can either take uh, 10, 1, 0, well, you can do whatever you want. There are infinitely many options. But the ones that hit my eye are 10, 1, 0, negative 1, and 1, minus 2, 1, 0. Let's do the first one. And what happens when I multiply a by little n. 
right? You get zero, but I want everybody to actually do that mentally and to, of course, get zero. Well, of course you get zero because when you multiply this matrix by this vector, it's 10 of this, one of this, minus one of this. That's by design zero. So the challenge here is realizing that what you, whichever way you think about this system, it matches up with the definition for matrix multiplication. So this prettier n is zero. And I'll make it bold because it's the zero, not zero, the number. Zero, the vector. And that would be true for any element in the null space. So I can even write A, if may I write it this way? Yes, I may. A times capital N equals zero, right? Meaning any vector from the null space. Well, but what does it mean? So I could express the null space as a matrix. I would simply take the basis for the null space and put it as the columns in that matrix, and I can call that matrix my capital N. So you can think of it this way. Or you can think of this expression as infinitely many of these, all possible ones. Do it whichever way you want. Okay. Okay, well now, let's prove what we've always claimed and explained before, but let's now prove it. If you're not allergic to the word proof, right? Some math majors here. Okay, there are good proofs and there are bad proofs. Good proofs, when you learn at the proof and you say to yourself, my goodness, I just learned something. That's a useful proof. And then there are proofs of things that you kind of knew were true anyway, and it was just a big mess of technicalities. That's a horrible proof from the teaching point of view. It's still necessary. Math needs it. Students don't need it. But this is a proof that students need. So here we must go in two directions. Both are equally simple. We must prove that if we take anything of this form, a particular solution plus anything from the null space, it will be a solution. So if I take, if I, if that this x evaluated thusly a particular solution of your choice, your particular solution, which may be different from, plus any vector from the null space is a solution to the equation. Well, how do you do it? Algebraically, you, you multiply it by A and see if you get B. If you get B, it's a solution. If you don't get B, it's not a solution. So we basically have to evaluate, this is our prep area, and this is our proof area. You basically have to apply A to X and see if you get B. Let's see. Well, we don't have a choice. We know what X is. X is a particular solution plus anything from the null space. So you can write little n here if you want to say a representative vector, any vector, or you can put n saying, well, let's do it for all at once. Doesn't matter whether you focus on one, but any one or all at once, up to you. Can I, can I apply the distributive law? Yeah, that's the essence of matrix multiplication. It's distributive. It's nothing if it's not distributive. In fact, if it's distributive, it's probably a matrix product. That's, that's what distributive means. Synonymous, more or less, with matrix product. So we'll have A multiplying your particular solution plus A multiplying any element of the null space. And the answer is, what is this? B, B. What is this? Zero. So the answer is B. And we have therefore proven algebraically, which kind of showcases that algebra is great even when you can't divide. Algebra where you can only multiply is still great if you have additional insight. Okay, so we have proven that anything of this form is a solution. Now we have to prove that the more interesting one and what almost seems like, hey, that would be confusing. I wouldn't know how to approach that. We have to prove that any Anything, that, that any vector that is a solution to the system can be written as your particular solution plus some vector from the null space. <coughs> That's going the opposite way, right? So right now, so far we've shown that an expression like this doesn't pick up any extras. That's what we've shown. That if it has this form, it's a solution. But now we have to 
uh, make sure that it doesn't leave anything on the table, that any solution whatsoever can be written as your particular solution plus something from the null space. Okay. Other than that, it's, it's actually one of those proofs that kind of disappears before your eyes and you're not sure what happened because nothing really happens, but then something actually did happen. Those are the best ones because you have to be totally focused on what's going on. So let's pick a solution. I won't call it X anymore. I'll call it Y for your solution. I want to show that your solution, is that what I want to do? I want to show, no, not Y. S for some solution. <laughs> I'll choose S. I want to show that any one solution must be your choice of particular solution plus something from the null space. So I'll call it S. That's some solution to the system. And I will show you that no matter what particular solution you chose, do you see how many words there it is? Even though I'm repeating myself, there's still a lot of words and almost no writing. It's just something to learn in math. When you read books, they're short and concise and very compacted, right? And you think that math is like that. And math is not at all like the textbooks makes it appear. Math is a lot of talking, a lot of emoting, a lot of anger, frustration, and joy, and very little equations, right? Equations are just little anchors for your thoughts. So that I will write almost nothing, but this will have some subtlety. So some solution, and I want to show that it's the particular solution plus your choice of null space. <clears throat> so here's what I'll do. I'll subtract your, excuse me, your choice of a particular solution. That it's your choice of a particular solution plus some vector from the null space. I think I misspoke. So what I will do is I will subtract your choice of a particular solution from the given solution. And I will show that this difference is in the null space. And if I do, if this is in the null space, if this difference is in the null space, then definitely this solution is your particular solution plus something from the null space. You guys agree with me? So all I have to do is that this difference between some solution and your choice of a particular solution, no matter what it is, is some vector in the null space. So, how do, so now I'm asking myself, is this vector in the null space? How do I decide algebraically whether it's in the null space? Exactly. Multiply it by A and see if you get zero. Let's see if we get zero. Let's multiply it by A. Can I use the distributive law? Yeah, okay. I get AS minus AX particular. Okay, what does AS equal? B, because we, we agree that S is a solution, some solution. So if all it is is AS equals B, so it's B. And what is A times a particular solution? Also B, so I have B minus B equals fat zero, the zero the vector. So there you go, I proved that this is in the null space. So QED, no, I don't know what it stands for, but that's how you end the, and you drop the mic. <laughs> Not the lapel mic, yes. Oh, because XP, XP is a, is a solution. We call it particular solution, but it's a solution. So being a solution means that AXP equals zero. We kind of documented it here. And then we said S is just some solution, but it's still a solution. So AS is also B. That's what it means to be a solution. So it's the skill that comes with practice of just translating everything into matrix algebra. So remember it was hard when you had to translate in fifth grade word problems into equations. Remember it was hard and then it became easy. This is the same thing. You have to translate linear algebra ideas into the more constrict, constrained language of matrix algebra. So no matter what you say, you just have to turn it into a matrix identity. And so the proof is complete. This is in the null space. So S must be XP, your choice of a particular solution, plus something from the null space. So it's proven that all solutions, in other words, the general solution, has this form. Looking at the time. OK, eight minutes. More than enough time 
to present and then you'll have to think about it. I will now show you that this is the exact same thing and will therefore write out what the solution looks like. It's not important what the solution is, but it is important what the solution looks like. So what I'm looking at here on the left hand side is something that's done to you. I see it as a black box. You give me you, I give you you prime. What is it that I do to you? I find its second derivative. I multiply it by 1 plus t. I, subtract, I find its first derivative, subtract 6 of it from what I had before, and then I add 8 times what I had before. Excuse me, 8 times u itself. It's sort of a complicated thing. But if you gave me t squared, let's just do that one example. If you gave me t squared, I would give you back 2 times 1 plus t minus 12t plus 8t squared. You guys see how that worked? That's what I'm doing to you. Let me describe what I'm doing to you by calling it A. Capital A is what I do to you. <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> Capital A is what I do to the function U. I will call it AU. So some people come from timid fields where they would denote it as A. When the argument is the function, they tend to put it in square brackets. But we won't even do that. We'll just say AU. And, what, and the result that we get, we'll call it B. And so, based on this similarity, I'm, I can say here that this matrix does something to this vector. What does it do? It multiplies it. What property does multiplication have? The distributive property. That's the only property we used on where I, what I erased, right? Did we use anything but the distributive property? No. It's called, the linear algebra term for it is, it's a linear action. It's a linear transformation. It's linear. Right? This is also doing something to you. So if we want this, so it's already a little bit parallel to this. But if we wanted it to be fully parallel to this, all we would need is the distributive property. For example, if you gave me one function, and I did this to it. And then you gave me another function, and I did this to it. And then you gave me the sum of those two functions, and I once again did this to the sum. Would the final result be equal to the sum of the first two results? Well, you kind of have to analyze it. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but the basic question is, is it true that A applied to U1 plus u2 equals a of u1, a applied to u1, plus a applied to u2. The distributive property. If that's true, and, we can spend, and we'll spend a little bit of time analyzing, is it true? Remember, those of you who took my linear algebra class, I tortured you asking, is it linear or is it not? Is it a linear property or not? This is the quintessential application of this way of thinking. You have to look at this, it's called operator, because it takes functions and returns functions. You have to look at this operator and ask yourself, <clears throat> is it linear? And you will very quickly develop an eye for when it's linear. And this one is. And so the analogy is complete, because I have the distributive law. And remember that this distributive law is all I needed to argue that all possible solutions look like this. So all possible solutions in this case <clears throat> will look like this. U of t will be u particular of t plus the null space of this operator. That's what all solutions will look like. And I will now go one step further and I will tell you that the null space is two-dimensional because this operator is second order. 
It's one of these fundamental truths of nature. If the linear operator is second order, its null space is two-dimensional. So equals, I will rewrite this as u particular. You just have to guess one. <clears throat> Plus c1 times one function. Of, let's call it n1 because it belongs in the null space. n1 of t. Plus c2 n2 of t. That's what the general solution to this ordinary differential equation will look like. I cannot solve this equation. This 1 plus t messes me up completely. You know, it's some very special function. Maybe not so special. I'm pretty sure it's very special, the function that solves this OD. I think that messes it up substantially. We'll see. Right? But it doesn't change the fact at all that the solution will look like this. Depending on what ingredients I'll pepper in here, what this function is and what these functions are may change. But what will not change is that the solution looks like this. And I don't even have to prove it because I just did. This whole argument that I was using 10 minutes ago already proved that as long as A has the distributive property, which you'll make sure that it does in this case, this does not mess it up. You know, I'll just throw in. This would mess it up. Did you see what I did? I put a u squared here. Now we're dead in the water. All of this goes away because linearity went away. Distributive property went away. So I don't know what the general solution looks like anymore. But when everything's linear, I have already proven, because the analogy is complete, that the general solution to this equation looks like this. And that's the most important thing as mathematicians that you should be able to do, which is look at a problem that you're presented and within it recognize the problem that you've already solved. 